And now, the survival show that once survived a survival fiction marathon. In this episode, we sit down with Chris Weatherman, a.k.a. Angry American, author of the Surviving Home series. And this is the first in the ITRH Book Club episodes. We're going to discuss what inspires him to write, his books, and practical survival lessons you may take away from his books. Howdy, and welcome to In the Rabbit Holes, Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 168. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Chris, welcome to In the Rabbit Hole. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Now, you are the author of nine books. Man, that is a lot of freaking writing. Yeah, it's uh, everybody says it's a lot, but honestly, it's not as many as I wish I was putting out. Um, I mean, I think I could crank out one a day, and, and I would be able to keep up with what the fans want. Wow. And, uh, and I'm always trying to give them more. I have a goal this year to put out four. I've already put out one, and uh, I'm working on the second one now. I hope to have it done here in about two months. And then it'll be on to three and four, but I want to put out four books this year. Cool. So now, before we dive in super deep into your writing, let's get to know you for, for those that don't know you that well. And kind of a personal question, how did you come to writing? I, I ask that because I know I end up finding that a lot of writers come to it at a very young age and then tend to not think much about it and then come back to it later. Is that what happened for you or, or what's your story? Yeah. Yeah, actually, it is. When I was in high school, I was very good at creative writing, um, and I used to do a lot of it. And then probably in the 90s, it wasn't long after the internet got real popular, you mm-hmm. know, and you could actually use it for things. Uh, I was part of a writing forum where I was I would go in and write stories. And uh, I was writing one on there, and uh, it was about the same kind of stuff I write now. It was actually about a, a Islamic uh, attack on the Mall of Millennia in Minnesota. Mm. And, um, you know, just kind of, the kind of like what happened in Brussels today, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I had to be browsing through a bookstore one day and picked up the Atlantic Monthly and found almost my exact story verbatim in the Atlantic Monthly. Oh, man. I mean, like, almost exactly mm. verbatim. And it really disheartened me that to think that someone would plagiarize some idiot like myself who was just writing on a forum online. And maybe the guy didn't, but the the parallels were so close that it was really disheartening. And so I didn't, I just, I didn't write anything else for years. Mm. And then, uh, one day about, I don't know, five years ago, four and a half years ago, I was reading stories online on a forum that the guys had wrote. And I thought, you know, these are all pretty cool, but they're all kind of missing something for me personally. And I was just like, what the hell? I'm going to write one. And literally that much forethought. I went, what am I, what is it going to be about? All right, I'll do it about an EMP. All right, what's the character going to be doing? All right, I'll do this. So like all of 10 minutes forethought, I sat down and wrote a 5,000-word piece and posted it online. Hmm. That was the opening of Going Home, hmm. and it took on a life of its own. It was, you know, Dr. Frankenstein's monster came to life right there. Very cool. Yeah, and it, by the time I was done with that, it had over 2 million views online. I hmm. mean, it, it really took off. So where did you end up posting that? On a, on a forum called Survivalist Boards. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, I know that. I was a real active member there for a long time. I'm not anymore, uh, only because Kevin and I, I was the most viewed contributor on his forum. Mm. I had the most views of anything I did there, by, by far the most viewed. And um, when I was getting ready to publish Going Home at the demands of the people there, because I wasn't going to publish it, I contacted him and said, hey, let me do some banner ads or something. I'll buy ad space. Let's promote this. We, it was wrote here. Let's kind of work together and promote it. And, and the guy wouldn't even return my emails. Oh, uh, that always sucks. And it just kind of miffed me, you know. It just yeah. sort of like, you know, I'm bringing way more traffic to his board than anything else is right now. And the guy won't even take the time out to talk to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, uh, I left. I just, you know, actually started my own little forum. It's nowhere near the size of his. It's a lot smaller. But we really control who's in there and what's going on. Um, and now I, I just write the books instead of posting them online. Very cool. So now you go by the pen name Angry American with an extra E. Yeah. Why the extra E? 
Well, there's a spell. There's a definition for that spelling of angry, and it's the facetious use of the word angry. It's to be angry over something trivial or nonsensical. But the reason for it is it's kind of a play on it because that's how the government sees a lot of our concerns and issues: trivial, nonsensical, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and you know irrelevant. But to us, they're not. They're real issues, and they're they're really the real issues that we need to be worried about. And so it was just kind of a play on the word, and it was my username over there. Still is my username over there. And since I wrote Going Home and Surviving Home on the forum under that name, when I went to publish, I just kind of stuck with it because no one know, knew my name. It's not like I was hiding. It's just if I had to publish it under my name, everybody would be like, who the hell's that? Yeah. But if I published it with the Angry American, everybody knew who it was. And that's the whole reason that I kept using it. Okay. That makes, that makes sense. I like, the, uh, yeah. I like the twist with the angry with the extra E. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So now, as we mentioned before, you've written nine books, but most notably is your your series. It's we've got Going Home, Surviving Home, Escaping Home, Forsaking Home. Uh, was it resu- is it Resurrecting Res- Home? Resurrecting okay. Home and Enforcing Home, and then Avenging Home. Avenging Home. Yeah. So your book titles all have the word home in them. What's the significance? Well, you know, it's that kind of home is where the heart is thing. It's in the prepping community, the survivalist community, we talk about bugging in and bugging out and all these various scenarios and whatnot. But it, it, in the end, we all work our lives to build a home. It's, it's where we want to be. It's what we, we all, we're all trying to achieve. And by home, I don't mean your ideal 40-acre homestead or whatever that is to you. It could be your apartment. It could be your house, your mobile home, wherever your home is. That's, that's where you're investing your time, energy, and, and treasure. You know, mm-hmm. um, and and so it's that concept of just trying to maintain that, and it's all the things that go with it. It's family, it's tradition, it's it's everything. You know, a homeless person. You know, when we see what we call a homeless person on the street, they're a person without all those things. They're like a you know a ship foundering in a storm. They have no port, um, and so that concept of home is kind of what anchors us. And and so that was the whole idea behind those titles of. Morgan Carter is always just trying to hang on to his home. Okay. And and by his home, it's his small community with his new family that that's, that grows and shrinks at times and back and forth. So it's just the idea of, of hanging on to that. In a, in a turbulent world where everything's falling apart, you want that one thing that's familiar and that you can rely on and, and that's there for you. Mm-hmm. That anchor. That anchor, exactly. I got you. Okay. Chris, let's take a quick break for this message. Listeners, ITRH is kept on the air by support from listeners just like you. Visit ITRH.net today to find out about the cool survival benefits ITRH Roving Horde Armada members get. Again, that's ITRH.net. Now, personally, I love podcasts too. They make it easy to get great information and entertainment, and they tend to make the drives kind of fly by. And over the last couple of years, for similar reasons, I've become a huge fan of audiobooks. It makes it easy to finally read that great book I've always been meaning to check out. Because of this, I've become a huge fan of Audible.com. So I'm very excited to welcome them as a sponsor of the ITRH Book Club episodes. Visit audibletrial.com slash ITRH to get a free audiobook such as Surviving Home, and a 30-day free trial. Seriously, if you've never tried it, you've got to. It's simple. You find a great book, you get it, and you can listen to it just about anywhere. Again, audibletrial.com slash ITRH for your free book and 30-day free trial. Now, back to Chris. A little while ago, we were talking about, you said you just kind of threw the storyline together quickly. Was there some inspiration, some spark, some something that, that initially drove you into this series? Well, like I said, when I was reading the other stories and thought, you know, these, these are all good, but they're, they're kind of missing something. What I did going home was I played out a what if scenario for me. I sat down and, and the armchair quarterback something. Mm-hmm. Um, the trip that Morgan Carter takes is a trip that I used to take when I was still working um, doing security systems for jails and prisons. It was a system or, or a, a trip that I took very often from my home in Lake County, North Lake County, up into southern Georgia. 
Uh, I knew the route like the back of my hand. I could drive it with my eyes closed because I drove it many, many, many times. And so I just kind of played it out. What would I do if I was that far away and something happened? How would I try to get home? Then I just started to play the story out um, and writing it down. And that's really how the whole thing happened. It was honestly a thought exercise for me. Okay. Uh, never dreamed it was going to become a book. I had no idea. <laughs> um, actually resisted for a long time. But um, i got to say the fans were persistent, thank God. And God bless them because it's changed things for me big time. Now you said... The other books were missing something for you. Was it, is it more of a, a general thing that they were missing over and over again? Or was it just a collection of each one kind of just for you got something wrong or just left something out? Yeah. The, the one thing that I hate, and, and, I might, and I'm probably guilty of it at some point too, is I hate the cliches that show up in survival books. Um, <laughs> cliches hate, in survival books? Uh, no, never. I, I really do. I mean, it just edges my teeth when I'm reading one and I see it. Yeah, it's the it's the he catches the uh, the the scope glint on the hill in the distance, you know that that kind of thing. Mm. Or they or they meet the bad guy in the in the opening chapter, only to let him go so he can return later with a with an army. It, that kind of thing just bugs me. Because in the real world, ultimately, a lot of these books are talking about violence. You're you're defending your home, or and really that's what it all comes down to. You're defending your home, your community, and in violence, action always beats reaction. Every time it goes into what we call the OODA loop. And if you're reacting, you're going to lose. You have to be acting. And so it's always action beats reaction. And mm. that's kind of what I do in the books. As we see, Morgan Carter, he's a bit brash. He doesn't always make the right decision. But the guy acts, and he acts quick uh, because he understands that. They're, you know, second place is the first loser in this world. Mm. And, and that's very important. And people have got to get their heads around that because even in self defense, what you're talking about is violence. Um, if you're defending your home, if you're defending your person, you're defending your family, whatever, you're talking about violence, and you've got to do more violence, bigger, harder, faster than the other guy if you're going to win. And that's kind of what it comes down to. Okay. So you brought up Morgan Carter a few times. Let's, let's dive into the main character. So what was your thought process for crafting a character, especially a main character, that the readers and fans could really connect with? Well, what I wanted him to be was kind of an everyman. He wasn't a former special forces ninja. <laughs> um, you know, he's not even prior service, this guy. He's just okay. a normal dude. He's, he's a dad. He's a husband. Um, he's just a normal guy that's, you know, he was aware. He prepared, like, like a lot of us do. He stocked food and weapons and ammo, but... Again, like a lot of people, he stocked weapons, but never stocked training in those weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and he, so he's just a normal guy, and he's got to try to make his way through this world. And you know, some people will rise to the occasion, and, and some people won't. Um, and you know, Morgan, he's trying to rise to the occasion, uh, sometimes against his own will. He doesn't want to be the guy that always has to do everything and make those decisions, but you know, he can and will. You know, mm. if it comes down to it, the guy will make a decision. He may regret that decision later, but he'll make a decision. And that's, honestly, it's what you got to do. You know, when I was an electrician, I had guys working for me. I would tell them all the time, make a decision, do something, and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. but, but make a decision. You've got to do something here, and you've got to decide what to do. We can't sit here and talk about it all day. Make a decision and go with it, and we'll sort it out down the road. Um, and honestly, that's what it comes down to, because... In a crisis situation, we hear there's, there's fight or flight, right? Yeah. Um, there's two things. There's, well, there's also a third one. There's people freeze, on yeah. yeah. Freeze. And a lot of people freeze. Mm. You can't freeze. You know, freeze is stationary. Target is just that, a damn target, the bullet magnet. So, and I hate to use that analogy, but it could be for anything. If a storm's coming, if you just freeze, or if a car's driving at you and you freeze, you're dead. So you've got to make a decision and you've got to act, and that's the biggest thing. Okay. And if you're saying he makes mistakes, do you intentionally write those in or do they just, is it a stream of consciousness for you? Kind of the writing process where they just happen and you're like, oh yeah, he would totally screw this up. Yeah. It, at this point, it's really a stream of consciousness thing. Um, these stories now write themselves, you know, it's like they're there. I, when I start writing, I don't, when I start a new book, I don't outline it. Um, I may, I generally have major plot points that I want to cover but I don't outline the plot point even. I just have an idea. And I let I walk the story with the characters. 
Um, I let them do what they do, the way they would do it, as they go along, and um, just behave as they would normally behave. Mm. And it's kind of odd that, that you can do that with so many different personality types at the same time all come out of one head. And it's really a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Some of the characters I love to write because, like, the character Sarge is in my books. That guy can and will say anything at any given time. And if I have something I kind of want to say, a statement I want to make, I'll let him make it because everybody would be like, oh, yeah, he'd totally say that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's kind of a mouthpiece if I want to say something that might offend folks with touch. I can, I can have him do it and people will be like, yeah, he'd say that. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, I just walk the story with him. Um, I sit down. I might read the previous paragraph I just wrote, and I start from right there, and I just go with it. And, and let the story develop itself. Does that end up being a lot of editing for you later, or does it just work? Honestly, it just works. Um, editing, I, I, we spend a lot of time on editing, hmm. um, but unlike a lot of writers, and this may be good or bad, I'm a one-and-done author. Okay. I write things, I write things one time. Because mm-hmm. um, I've learned over time that Usually my first idea was my best idea. And if I go back and try to redo it, I muddle it up and I just mess it up. So I, I write it one time. And, of course, we got to go back and you know check for the grammar and the errors and stuff, mm. which I've yet to be successful in getting all of them out of the book. I really do try. People, some people give me some grief over it. But the thing I don't do, which I'm going to do, and now the reader's going to pay for that, is going to have to wait a little bit longer, is I'm going to start using beta readers to read them before I publish them. Mm. Um, the only reason I've never done it before is time thing. I didn't want to take the time it requires to get that done, but now you guys are going to have to wait longer because I'm going to use the beta readers to get rid of those little errors <laughs> so you can stop telling them about it. Um, but I know I'm guilty of it, and it's only because I'm in such a hurry. I really try hard to get these things out fast. And, uh, there's a difference between speed and quality, mm-hmm. and I, I want the quality to be a little bit better. So. All right. So now we've danced around this a lot. Walk, but walk us into the book. Where does the series start? Well, it starts with Morgan Carter. He's, he's on his way home from southern Georgia down into Lake County. Um, it's like a Friday afternoon, about 4 o'clock, and he's driving on I-10 heading home when his car dies. So the story is essentially based on an EMP. You know, his car dies outside of Tallahassee. He, he coasts the side of the road. And being that he's a prepper and, and, and in this world, he starts to figure out pretty quick what happened. And he comes to the realization of, of how far away from home he is and what it's going to take for him to get back to his family. And he realizes he's going to have to walk. And so going home is all about that trip home, everything that happens to him on his way. He meets some good people. He makes some good friends. He meets some not-so-good people. And just all the little things that, that it takes to do something. I mean, 250 miles on foot. We think about that today, and we're like, oh my gosh, that, that, you know, who could walk that? Well, it wasn't that long ago that that really was the only form of transportation we had. Mm-hmm. You know, the soul train, you know? And so he, he has to walk home. The subsequent books pick up there about, you know, surviving home. Just once he's home, he finds out, you know, the whole time he's walking, he, he only talks to his wife one time via ham radio. So he has very little idea of what's happening at home. And he gets home to find out that his community, unlike what we would all hope and pray that our communities would band together and work together, his didn't. Mm. You know, they're really kind of all out for themselves, and it's devolved into a bit of an issue. And this is where Morgan steps in and starts making some of those rash decisions that, you know, come back to haunt him later. I want, you know, if people haven't read it, I won't tell them what he does, but he does something in front of the entire community that, that, that most people would be horrified by. Mm-hmm. Um, but he does it because he thinks it's what's necessary. I actually did read that book, and I remember that, and I remember going, "Yeah, I can totally see where he's coming from with that." Yeah, you know, and I think it would probably be something I would do. <laughs> I mean, how can you turn your back on someone like that? Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. You've got to do something, and and it don't matter if it's a man or a woman or a grandmother or you know a teenage kid. You know, all of them are capable of killing you. Yes, and and this goes back to action is faster than reaction. Mm-hmm. It trumps it every time. So now you mentioned EMP. Is that is that something? I guess let me put it this way: we we all sort of have some pet thing that either gets us in prep or kind of keeps us in prep. Is EMP uh, yours, or was it just that's where the story took you? 
it's it's just where the story took me. And honestly, I started with EMP because I wanted to set the world up for as bad as it could be. Okay. Out of the shoot. Um, and for our world, an EMP is about the worst. Well, short of asteroid strikes or something crazy like yeah. that. That's like a an extinction level event. Mm-hmm. But for our te- for our modern world, an EMP is one of the worst things that could happen. Um, we have a very modern society, you know, the luxuries are at our fingertips. So by luxuries, I mean air conditioning and electricity and water, running water, clean water. Those are luxuries. You go spend time away from those things where you have to go get water and carry it to where you want it and then purify it. You'll understand what a luxury running water is. People take it for granted today. Mm. And I've had the discussion often with, with people that we've created a artificial um, reality, really. It's not a natural system we live in, full of what I call synthetic life forms. You know, the Kardashians and all those kind of people, the the, the rich, the Hollywood, the wealthy types that mm. would not be able to function in a natural environment. They they live in a synthetic world, um, and if thrust into a natural environment of having to hunt their food, you know, find their water and, pur- and purify, it, build a shelter. You know, collect firewood, keep themselves warm. They wouldn't survive, and it's not just them. There's there's millions of people, hundreds of millions of people in this country that wouldn't be able to do those basic things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the average person, you could hand them a rabbit, a live rabbit, and say, "That's your dinner tonight. Deal with it," and they wouldn't know where to begin. Um, you know, even the thought of having like having to kill a rabbit would would just horrify them, and and take it on up. You know, if if, if you're if they managed to survive and they were wandering the wastelands and, and they were hungry and they saw a cow, what would they do with it? Mm. You know, if they managed to kill the thing, they would, you know, hack off some meat to eat that day, waste that animal, you know, because they wouldn't know how to address it. Mm. Um, and so it's it's we, we, we've created an artificial environment that's not natural, and and again, these synthetic life forms, as I call them, <laughs> not to be crude or, or or nothing to them, but that's what they are. Mm. They don't. They cannot exist in a natural environment. Um, and I pride myself on being able to exist in a natural environment. Mm. Yeah. So now, I noticed the series is referred to as the survivalist series on Amazon. Do you yeah. consider yourself a survivalist or a prepper, or do you use the terms interchangeably? I ask that because for some people, it's a big deal. Other people are like, I don't know, whatever. Now, well, the, the whole survivalist series thing, something Penguin hung on it. wasn't my idea, and I actually argued against it, but uh, I lost. Yeah, I don't, I don't care. You know, you can call me a survivalist. You can call me a prepper. I've been called worse by better folks. I don't really care. <laughs> um, you know, some of them on TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect me. I, I'm, uh, I personally like the term survivalist. I truly do, in the purest form, not the, the bunker-dwelling ammo polishing kind of survivalist, but just a survivalist. I, I can survive. Hmm. Um, you know, and we all have our caveats and our issues. You know, I, I did a TV show where I got a lot of flack coming out, but you know, that wasn't a survival situation and, uh, me and canines don't mesh. That's all I can say. So <laughs> what was, uh, what was the TV show? Oh, it was histories alone. Okay. Uh, they put 10 of us out in Vancouver Island. Uh, huh. um, and left us to see who could stay the longest. And um, I had a pack of wolves show up in the middle of the night. Oh, and, fun. Uh, and me and dogs just don't blend. I have an issue with dogs. I've been bit many, many, many. I mean, I was in Vegas at the SHOT Show and got bit there at the God. SHOT Show. And people were laughing hilariously when it happened because it wasn't a bad bite. But the fact that when this dog saw me, this German Shepherd saw me, it lost its mind. Hmm. I mean, just when it looked at me and the people were apologizing, were, we don't know why it's acting. I'm like, your dog's fine. It's not your dog. Don't worry about him. He's not going to do this to anybody else. And it wasn't three minutes later. He, he bit the hell out of me. Mm. And, um, and I was with a bunch of guys, uh, SF type people, and they were just laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen because I told him it was going to happen. I said, watch him. He'll, he'll get me. And he did. So <laughs> it's that so, ham you carry around in your pocket, Chris. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> me and dogs just, just don't blend. And, uh, so when I had a pack of wolves show up, mm. In the middle of the night, on Vancouver Island at night, with no man-made lights, didn't have a fire yet, it was so dark, it's like being underground. Hmm. And all I could do was hear these dogs. 
but they were close. They were within about 30 feet of me. Oh, wow. That's, that's And the next creepy. morning, I verified that by their tracks. Uh. Where they were. And so for me, that was just a terrifying moment. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is a stupid TV show. I don't need to be here. I'm not going to put up with this. I'm out because I'm not going to get attacked by a dog. Because mm-hmm. that's just my thing. I mean, I, I don't do dogs. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. My Squirrels, okay. Know. Dogs, not so much. I've got three dogs, but other people's dogs, and I got another one coming. I got a, a tra- one that's going to be a trained protection dog coming. Mm. That's going to be a lot of fun, probably. But yeah, it just, I didn't need that issue. So <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. I remember seeing the ads for the show, but never did watch it. But that, that's interesting. Now I'll have to go back and, and watch it a little bit. Yeah, go check it. It's a really good show of, of what we call survival reality TV. Yeah. It is the best one that's ever been done. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I'll definitely it, it go truly, see it. Because there was no BS. I mean, I was there. I know. There was no BS. They literally dropped us and left us mm-hmm. to our own devices. And it was just call us when you want to come out. Cool. So now you've also written Charlie's Requiem and I can't read my own handwriting here. The Ramblin' Man. The Rambling Man. Okay. Yeah. So are these standalone books or do they have something to do with the home series? Ramblin' Man was a standalone. It was actually a novella set in Stephen Conkley's world of the Jakarta pandemic. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was a novella set inside of his world that I did based off of a, a, a friend of mine from years ago. <laughs> I know somebody just like the main character there. And uh, Charlie's Requiem is one I co-authored with a friend of mine that's a novella set in the going home world okay so it's it's set inside of the same universe of what's happening and going home but it takes place in orlando and it was pretty well received so we're actually walt browning the guy that did it and i are doing a full-length novel um, that'll come out in just a few months of charlie's requiem to follow his characters through and we're going to go ahead and play that one out because everybody seemed to like it Mm -hmm. Um, that one has a little different play on things these are not preppers in any aspect of the word. These are just normal people that find themselves thrust into these situations and they try to deal with it. Oh, okay. That should be interesting. You know, that brings up, you, you brought up uh, the Jakarta pandemic. What, what authors inspire you and uh, give you like, oh, wow, okay, that was good. You know, maybe I should try something like that in my next book. Or like, where do you, well, who do you look to for inspiration? Well, now that I write, I find I don't read nearly as much as I used to. Yeah. I used to be a voracious reader, and, and my wife would get on me because I'd have books scattered around the house. There'd be one by the bed, one in the living room, one on the table beside my chair, and, you know, one or two in the bathroom, you know, in the reading room. And she would get on to me about reading all these different novels at the same time. But now that I'm writing, I find I don't read as much, mainly because I don't, I don't want to get their ideas into my head and disrespect them by doing something. You know, mm-hmm. sounds kind of weird. No, I know exactly what you mean. But um, I do have some favorite books. I mean, probably my all-time favorite post-apocalyptic novel is The Last Babylon. And that is a damn good book. I, I love that book. I've got the audio book, and I mean, I was just in Nebraska, and when I was coming home, I listened to it again. And I can, I can listen to that one over and over and over. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, things like Lucifer's Hammer, some of the ones that were wrote years ago, I find are generally better mm-hmm. than a lot of stuff today. But there's some really good guys out there. I like Steve, Franklin Horton, um, you know, Bobby Acard, the guys that are doing some stuff today are, are really good. G. Michael Hopp, he's a good friend of mine. He's a really good author. Those are the guys that I, that I follow. I, you know, I keep them tabs on what they're doing and, and how they're doing things. That's really ab- about it right now. I mean, I was a, a fan of Rawls. I used to read his stuff. I haven't read anything of his in quite some time now. I didn't even finish the Patriots series. Mm-hmm. It, got a little it had issues for me personally so i just quit reading it okay um but patriots i thought was a fantastic book I, mm. you know a little preachy but it was a good book just a touch just, yeah yeah <laughs> just uh, put it mildly yeah. but it was a good book but you know and see I, I i see myself as the counterpoint to rawls of in rawls's books these people have an unattainable level of preparedness mm-hmm. that most people will never ever achieve and and to, his, to Rawls' way of thinking, and you know, and, and he has this. I mean, to his credit, he does have this. He lives it, yeah. He lives it, yeah. But to his way of thinking, if you don't have these things, you can't survive. And that's, that's just kind of set people up for failure. You know, if they know they can never achieve it, why bother? Exactly. 
So I, I approach things from a much smaller, more realistically attainable goal and, and end goal, really. Mm. You know, it's like I tell people, anything you do today is that much more ahead of everybody else because they're not doing anything. You know, so even if it's only a five pound bag of beans, you know, and a sack of rice, and you put in a mylar bag today, you're that much farther ahead than everybody else because they're not even doing that. So anything you can do, you know, if it was five gallons of gas that you poured some stay bill in today and stuck behind the garage, you're just that much farther ahead. You eat an elephant one bite at a time. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. That's just the best way to do it. So, you know, that kind of brings up in a way uh, another question I had for you, which is. Uh, What's your prepper pet peeve? Like, what do you see other people, it can be anything, advice given or just something you see people do over and over again that you're like, ah, oh, I wish people would stop doing that. Well, there's a number of things. One of the things that, that I've started to pay attention to here recently is the reliance on stuff over skill. Mm-hmm. Stuff's great. I love stuff. I'm a gear junkie and everybody who knows me knows it. I'm a gadget I mean, you, ooh, shiny. I'm all over it, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and I love gadgets. I love gear. I love new kits and bags and all the stuff that goes in them. I mean, I'm all about that. I do. But you've got, there's got to be more to you than that. Just because you go out and buy these things, you know, doesn't make you a, a survivalist. And I'm going to use that term because I don't mean prepper. Hmm. doesn't make you a survivalist. A survivalist, the root of the term is survival, you know. We can then we can extrapolate that to survivor that means mm. you survived. Just being prepared doesn't necessarily mean you're going to survive. You've got to have the skills and the fortitude to use that stuff. And so we see the memes on Facebook every now and then about nobody needs a three thousand dollar AR fifteen. They need an eight hundred dollar AR fifteen, you know, and twenty two hundred dollars for the training. Mm-hmm. And that's very accurate. Whatever your plan is, you need to train for those things. And there's a lot that folks need to learn. We need to know how to use our weapons effectively. We need to know how to treat the medical emergencies that are going to come up. I don't mean try to be a surgeon because we're not going to be. Right. But to deal with as much as we can. We need to know how to plan our food and take care of it, how to take care of our our animals if we're going to have livestock, which that's a whole other thing that I want to get started on, the livestock end of things. I went through several evolutions on that and, and played them out in my head and Livestock is, is only, depending on where you live, it's only as good as long as you can feed them. Mm-hmm. And so if you have livestock that's feed heavy, feed requirements are heavy, they're only going to last you so long unless mm-hmm. you're stocking up grain silos. You know, So livestock that can forage for itself is the better option. Goats, even chickens can do that to a degree. Small scale stuff. But, but skill sets, it's, it's all about skills. You, know? you can get a backpack full of goodies and wander off into the woods and that doesn't mean you're going to make it out. We see every year people yeah. die in the woods. With, you know, Things happen. And it's because they didn't have the knowledge and the skills to do what they were attempting. And ultimately what we're talking about here is, is life. I mean, this is you know, life and death. We don't know what form these things can take. And it doesn't have to be the end of the world. It can be a, a hurricane level or Hurricane Katrina level event. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be like the northeastern blackouts or the sandy hurricanes up north. You know. When you see those people on the news, why? How come nobody's coming? We need help. Well, help yourselves. You should yeah. be able to help yourselves, and that's what I'm talking about: is that kind of knowledge, you know, of how to get around these things. A lot of it is making do with less. You know, you're not going to be able to maintain your current lifestyle in these events. There's going to be some compromises, and you need to learn now how to get around a lot of these issues. Like when the water stops and you can't flush your toilet anymore, what do you do? You know, mm. most people, most people fill the bowl up, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, unsanitary, a host of issues there. But well, you need to learn how to dig a proper latrine, where to dig a proper latrine and how to get around the issue of, well, we've run out of toilet paper. What do we do now? Mm. Learn these things now. That's a simple thing you can, you can study, you know, um, one I'm currently dealing with. I have a wife and four daughters. One's not at home anymore, but I've got three here in my house. Feminine hygiene issues. That's a lot of feminine hygiene product, yeah. You can only stock so much of that stuff. Mm-hmm. What, what do you do when that runs out? And I don't care what it is or how much of it you have stocked. If the world comes to an end as we know it, yeah. you will run out. Okay. Mm. What do you do when it runs out? 
So figure it out now. We figured it out. We've got a solution. It's on its way. So no one's going to like using it, but they're going back to the old cotton fabric uh, style. Uh, yeah. You know? They're mm-hmm. reusable. They got to be washed. They got to be reused. They're effective and they're better than nothing. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a company called Luna Pads for women out there. You think about this. That's a product that you should have on hand as your worst case. That's your lifeboat issue there. That's you've got nothing else. Or if you're bugging out, think of a woman trying to bug out. How much of that stuff can they stuff into a backpack? Mm-hmm. Well, you can take a small handful of these things and stuff them into a backpack and you can reuse them. Yeah, you got to clean them, but you have a solution to mm. the problem. So, and it's just that kind of thing. Think these things out all the way and, and learn the skills necessary to, to deal with them now. And, and I consider that a skill. Identifying your issues, finding your solutions, and implementing them is as big a skill as anything else. Mm-hmm. Just say it. Oh, well, I've got 10 years with a toilet paper in there. Well, what happens if your house burns down? Now what are you going to do? What's your solution now? Or the basement flooded and it all got wet. Now what do you do? Mm-hmm. You know, I guess you can tear it off in chunks when it dries, you know. But, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, you need to have solutions to these issues. Mm-hmm. Not, not short term, but long term. Yeah. Well, so now on the flip side of that is everyone's favorite topic, which is gear. So what's your go-to rifle? AR, AK? Something more exotic? No, I'm a, I'm a standard AR guy. Mm. Um, I like the ergonomics. They're simple. But again, I know how to operate many, many, many weapons platforms. Mm-hmm. From FNFALs, G3s, AKs, you know, uh, Galils, you know, anything I think I could find. Yeah. I think everybody in this country should know how to operate, maintain, disassemble, reassemble, clear malfunctions and everything on an AR-15 and an AK-47. Mm-hmm. One in five battle rifles in the world is an AK-47. And in some places of the world, it's a lot higher than that. Yeah. So the AR-15 and the AK are the two things that I think everybody should know how to operate. AK-47 is pretty simple. It's kind of caveman simple. Yeah. Very few moving parts. But knowing how to pick that thing up and make it go bang is one thing. Knowing what to do with it when you pull the trigger and it doesn't go bang is something else entirely different. And you need to train on that. And that's something that we've been doing here lately uh, with some, some folks too, you know, clearing malfunctions, dealing with malfunctions, and what we call in cap drills of you've been wounded, you've only got one hand, clear this weapon. Mm-hmm. And we'll actually tie an arm up behind their back rather uncomfortably and, you know, tell them now run up there and, well, and put them under stress too. Jumping jacks, turning in circles, you know, get on the ground, get up, doing all this stuff, get, them, get their heart rate up, get their adrenaline flowing a little bit, and then make them get to a weapon and start firing. All the while, we'll have somebody else nearby firing into the same barricade they're shooting at just for that sensory overload. There's noise. There's the smell of gunpowder. You've got a malfunctioned weapon that you're trying to get back into the fight with one hand. Yeah. And how do you do that? It's a and lot even, of good stress. Even once they clear that initial jam, we've set the gun up to fail again and again and again. And they've got to just keep getting this thing going. And, and Because it's, it's like my buddy Alan tells people, if, if you're in a fight and your weapon jams, how long do you have to clear it? Mm. The rest of your life. That's how long you have. That's a good way of putting it. That's, you've got the rest of your life. However short it may be, if you don't get that gun cleared, it's going to be real short. Mm-hmm. You've got the rest of your life to do it. Hmm. That definitely resonates. Yeah. So now what would you say is the best $100 you've ever spent in prep? Wow, the best hundred dollars I ever spent. I know it's a tricky question. Hmm. Man, best hundred dollars I ever spent. My wife just looked at me, held her finger up, and she's got an extremely good point. And this <laughs> may sound cheesy, but she's right. Uh-huh. And it, and I didn't think of it. It takes somebody on the outside looking in. The best $100 I ever spent on preparing was the first $100 I ever spent on preparing. Very nice. Very nice. She's very right. She's very correct. She's smarter than I take her granted sometimes. <laughs> but no, that, and she's very right. Think about that. The, fir- the best $100 you all ever spent on preparing is the first $100 you spend because that means you're actually on your way. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good point. Because, yeah, I couldn't narrow it down to one thing. I've got mountains of stuff. Yes, yes, the you know? pile of prepper shit, as I like to call it. Oh, I, I mean, I've got closets and outbuildings. You know, I mean, I've got st- my wife's 
always, your shit is everywhere. I'm like, it's my house. It's where my shit lives. It lives in my house. Um, you know, every now and then I have to go through the house and, and do a gun cleanup, I call it. Uh -huh. They're scattered everywhere. And yeah. I go to the safe and start counting empty holes. One, two, three, four. There's seven guns in this house. Let's find them. And, you know, round them up and get them back in the safe. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my youngest daughter, the only one who's, well, my oldest daughter took to it too, but she's moved away now. Hmm. Colorado. But my youngest daughter really has taken to it as well. She loves it. She's got her own little bags. And she's got her own rifle and her own pistol. And, um, and she's all about it. And if I had to say that again, about the best hundred dollars, I would probably say it's the money I spent on her, my kids, getting them interested and getting them up to speed because, you know, kids are very impressionable. And yeah. if you make, make it fun, and that's another thing people need to think about during an emergency is get your kids involved. Your kids are going to read off of you. And if you're terrified and panicked and scared, think about how they're going to feel. They're going to be even more terrified, panicked, and scared. So the best thing you can do is make them part of the solution and not part of the problem. Give mm -hmm. them a job. If their only job, like one of my daughter's jobs here on a daily basis, is to keep our Berkey water filters full of water. Well, in a crisis situation, that's still her job. Keep those water filters full because that's where we get our water. That's where we're going to drink and cook and everything else. So make them part of the solution, not part of the problem. It will make them feel as though they're contributing and that they're not a burden, and it will ease their anxiety and ease yours because they're not under your feet. They're not driving you crazy. They're not sitting around being terrified. Give them a job. As mm. mundane as it is, I don't care if it's counting squares of toilet paper on the roll. Tell her we need to know how many each person gets to use. Give them something to do to make them feel that they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Just wanted to mention that because I always think about the kids. And I think a lot of people overlook them. I, I, yeah, I think people do. I definitely think people do. That's, uh, that's a really excellent point. And speaking of good points, going back to your books for a minute as we, we kind of round out here, your series has been really popular. Why do you think it resonates with so many people, especially in the community? I, I honestly, I'm not sure. Like I said, it, it, this all took me by surprise. I mean, I'm I'm happy it does, but I, I think there's several reasons for it. Number one, what everybody tells me, and, and I hate to say this because I wrote it, they're a good story. Mm. Um, people like that; that they're a good story. I try to avoid the cliche thing. There's struggle and strife. And these guys don't always get what they need exactly when they need it. They've got to find a way to do it. And one of the other things about it is I put real and useful information in the books. Yeah, these are fiction stories. But there's a lot of real ideas and, and tactics put in the book. One simple thing was what I call the, the, the chicken feeder in one of the books, which is a five-gallon bucket with holes drilled in the bottom of it. Mm. You suspend this from a tree, and you throw animal carcass in it. Flies will land in it. They'll lay eggs. The maggots will crawl around. They'll fall out the holes, and your chickens will come to expect this, and they'll wait under there for the maggots. Mm. It's, chicken, it's a chicken feeder. Mm. It's a way to supplement their food. So my books are full of things like that, little solutions to the, to the ordinary, everyday problems, but real solutions, not fictitious Pie in the sky solutions, real things that you're going to have to work to make happen, and you're going to have to pull off. Like, like here in the South, we have a lot of kudzu. So, mm. in one of the books I go into the how you prepare kudzu root, the fact that you can deep fry the leaves and eat them like potato chips, how to turn the root into flour. You know, I cover these kind of things because they're legitimate, real things that people can use later, and they may be a fiction book, but they can be a reference book for them too. And mm. that's one of the things I take a lot of pride in is, is giving that. A little piece of info. It may not mean much today, but someday it may make a real difference to somebody. So now, that's an interesting point. Now, when you write, you have the story. We kind of already got into that, that the story just comes. But have you found that at any point you write to get to a lesson you're trying to teach the reader? Or do you just find ways of weaving in the lessons? Well, kind of both. Sometimes I'll have a point that I really want to make, and I'll go through great lengths to get it in the book. Sometimes it's not easy. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort to make that happen. Other times, they simply present themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, location of where the, where the characters are, what they're doing, what they're trying to achieve. And I'll be like, oh, wait a minute. If they're here, they're, there's this or that. They could do this. Or maybe if I introduce this problem, I could show this solution. And so I'll do that as well. Mm. Um, so it's kind of a combination of both. Sometimes, though, it, like I said, I go through great pains to get those little things in there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Very cool. Now, you said you've got more books coming out on the way soon. What uh, what should readers expect from you uh, here in the near future? Well, there'll be the full-length co-authored novel of with Charlie's Requiem with um, Walt Browning. Um, Jeff Hopf and I are also working on a short novel called Hope that's set in the going-home world but takes place in California. Okay. And so that's one he and I are doing. Some of my fans who followed me on survivalist boards will remember a story called Cry Havoc that I started ooh, about five years ago. Uh, I'm currently working on that, and that will be the next novel that comes out. Okay. It's totally unrelated to going home. It's set in an entirely different world of what's happening, but very much appropriate to what is happening in today's world here in our country. So it's very prophetic kind of. And when I go back and look at it now, knowing how long ago I wrote this, I'm just like, wow, I can't believe some of the stuff's actually kind of happening. Mm -hmm. So that'll be the next one to come out. And of course, there'll be more in the Going Home series, but the last book, Avenging Home, some people said they'd like to see a satisfying end of the series. They've loved it, but, you know, some people feel that these things can get drug on too long. Mm. And I, so I wrote Going Home, the, the Avenging Home, to have a very satisfying ending. And for, and for those that, that want it to end there, it can end right there. Now, there's going to be an evolution in the story. The title scheme even changes. There's no more home in the titles. Um, and for those that have read it, they understand what's coming. Um, the world changes for everybody. And I also lifted the veil on the world because in all the books, all the characters knew was kind of what was happening around them in a very limited area, say a 100-mile radius, maybe. Mm. Well, I've lifted the veil on what's happening nationwide. Now we get a bit of a national view of things, and it's not good. So it's going to open up a lot of possibilities for where the stories are going to go. So there'll be a, a change to the titles. The foundation of the stories will stay the same, but the issues they're dealing with are going to be a lot bigger, a lot more profound. So Very exciting stuff. If someone wants to... Obviously, you've got your books all over Amazon and stuff. That's probably the biggest yeah. way people get, get to your books and stuff. But how do they connect with you and stay on top of when you have books and stuff like that coming out? Probably Facebook is the best way. Angry American on Facebook. If anybody wants to contact me, hit me up there. Um, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. I answer every message that comes through. And I, on, and I read every reply. If someone replies to something on there, I read it. Hmm. A lot of times I reply back. So I will always respond if someone contacts me there. There's also my forum, angryamerican.com. There's a forum there you can check out. You can join it. Uh, I'm in there you know, often. Not as much as I should be. I know some of the, my guys are going to tell me, you're not in here? Not, yeah, I know. But I get in there, too, and there's a chat room in there as well. And I might start setting up like a timed, scheduled chats where I'll definitely be in there if people want to pop in and talk. Mm -hmm. chat room on that forum as well. And I'm on Twitter, too, at The Angry American. So um, I don't tweet as much as some folks because... I don't like to do it unless I have something to say. I don't want to say something just to put out a tweet. So if I've got something to say, if you see a tweet coming out from me, it's because it's I got something to say. Mm. So, but those are the best ways to follow me. Well, awesome, man. Well, Chris, thank you again for being on the show today. We sure appreciate it. We look on, uh, look forward to having you on again when uh, your next book comes out. I appreciate it, Aaron. Yeah, anytime. Let me know. I'd be glad to come back. It's been great talking to you. Awesome, dude. A few quick notes before we close out the show today. The final episode of this season, season five, of ITRH will be on May 25th. ITRH will return August 1st for season six. And of course, you will be getting the traditional ITRH summer shorts roughly every three weeks while the show is on summer break. For Armada members, season five will be packed up, archived in the handy dandy full season download in your membership dashboard, as always. And Speaking of Armada members, ITRH is kept on the air by support from listeners just like you. Visit ITRH.net today to find out about the cool survival benefits ITRH Roving Horde Armada members get. Again, that's ITRH.net. Now, personally, I love podcasts too. They make it easy to get great information and entertainment, and they tend to make the drives kind of fly by. And over the last couple of years, for similar reasons, I've become a huge fan of audiobooks. It makes it easy to finally read that great book I've always been meaning to check out. Because of this, I've become a huge fan of audible.com. So I'm very excited to welcome them as a sponsor of the ITRH book club episodes. Visit audibletrial.com 
Audible.com slash ITRH to get a free audiobook such as Surviving Home and a 30-day free trial. Seriously, if you've never tried it, you've got to. It's simple. You find a great book, you get it, and you can listen to it just about anywhere. Again, audibletrial.com slash ITRH for your free book and 30-day free trial. With that, we wrap up episode number 168. You can get resources and comment on this episode by going to intherabbithole.com slash E168. From the Lone Star State, till next time, stay safe and sound.